Let's talk about cardiac support devices. Um, now, obviously there's new devices being developed all the time, and so this lecture may become dated at some point, um, but there are some standard uh, devices that have been in use for a long time and will probably continue to be in use. Uh, and there's also general principles uh, that will apply for any device. Um, so I'm gonna focus here on mostly on imaging of their positioning uh, with chest radiographs uh, with a few mention of CT findings um, as we delve in there. And again, this is gonna focus on cardiac support, in other words, cardiac functional support devices for use in patients with either left or right ventricular dysfunction. And I'm not really gonna get into the physiology of these except as they apply in imaging. Um, and I'm not going to talk about long-term LVADs, which is a different topic. So first we'll talk about intraaortic balloon pumps. Um, you are probably familiar with these. They're inserted through a femoral artery in the groin, um, and they uh, are positioned within the descending aorta. These balloons inflate, um, as you can see in this example, in the diastolic phase and provide uh, pressure for uh, coronary perfusion during diastole. They deflate during systole uh, for afterload reduction. Now you'll see that these balloons are quite long and they typically have at least one radiopaque marker on the cranial end and they may have a second radiopaque marker along the caudal end, although that's variable. Um, you, they more recently people are using axillary approach balloon pumps and I'll show you an example of those uh, a little bit later. You can see this balloon pump tip is at the level of the aortic arch and that's um, acceptable position. You do not want it any more proximal. In other words, you do not want it in the arch itself or in the ascending aorta because then it could occlude the uh, branch vessels, the great vessels. Uh, going to the neck. You don't want it very distal in the descending aorta because it can occlude the uh, mesenteric or renal arteries. So the appropriate positioning is as high as the top of the aortic knob here um, and as low as a few centimeters below that. Um, but you really don't want it in the mid to distal descending aorta or any anything below that. Now even though the positioning by radiograph is acceptable in this case, this balloon is actually too long and on an abdominal CT you can see, so first of all you see the air in the inflated balloon here within the aorta, so that's normal, it just happens to be that we imaged in diastole and you can see that this patient has delayed nephrograms, this is a non-contrast CT, they got contrast for a previous study and you can see delayed nephrograms because this balloon was occluding the origins of the renal arteries. So even though the cranial position was correct, the balloon was too long in this case. And that's something that the cardiologist will monitor for, obviously, as well. Now, here is an example of a balloon pump inserted through the axillary approach. And it's difficult for us to know that, except that these balloons tend to have two radiopaque markers. Here is the marker on the cranial end and here is the marker on the caudal end. Uh, you can see them a little bit better with this edge enhanced image. You can see the balloon is partially inflated on this radiograph. So the cranial marker being in the, in this case, it's in the subclavian artery, that's acceptable because that's above the level of the balloon. You can see the balloon itself is not, uh, is inflated in the distal arch or approximately the sending aorta, not in the subclavian artery itself. If the balloon were inflated in the subclavian artery, of course, uh, that would that could potentially cause some ischemia. Now, here is an example of a balloon pump that's actually too proximal. You can see that the balloon is inflated. This was also an axillary approach pump, by the way. And you can see that the balloon is here inflated partially in the aortic arch, as well as, of course, here is the portion in the descending aorta. There is the proximal marker, there's the distal marker. So we can see that the balloon is partially within the aortic arch itself, uh, which is obviously not ideal positioning. And this was subsequently repositioned. 
more distally for more appropriate positioning. Again, not to occlude the artery supplying uh, blood to the, to the brain. A more recently developed device that's related is essentially a long-term balloon pump. Um, is The brand name is called New Pulse IVAS. And it has kind of an interesting appearance where there are implanted ECG leads. And remember that the balloon pump is actually triggered by the ECG so that it's inflated in diastole and deflated in systole. So these are implanted uh, ECG leads. Here's the device itself with some air in the line. You can see a marker in the proximal descending aorta. Um, so this is a sort of long-term balloon pump, uh, which you know is an alternative to uh, long-term LVADs because it does not require a sternotomy. So now moving on to uh, left ventricular assist devices. Um, one device is known as the impella, and that is placed for more short-term support through the through the groin. So here we can see this is the catheter portion. Uh, it has a sort of thicker part with two radiopaque ends and then a uh, J-shaped um, end loop there. This is ideally placed in the ventricular apex. The inflow is somewhere in this vicinity. There's a pump within the thicker part here. And then the outflow is somewhere near the um, near this, this other radiopaque end. So ideally the inflow would be in the left ventricular cavity. And the outflow is gonna be past the aortic valve. Now this, uh, and as I mentioned, the loop is supposed to be positioned towards the apex. Now this one, you can see that the loop is kind of more in the basilar left ventricle. And this was actually subsequently repositioned for more optimal function. As you can see here, now it's more in the apex. You can see a little bit better on this edge enhanced view. Again, inflow level of the aortic valve is somewhere in here where the bend in the catheter occurs and the outflow is gonna be somewhere here into the ascending aorta. And in this case, the, it's another example of the impella being positioned too, um, too distally, too, too much into the aorta. Again, here's the J tip at the end. Um, that's where we would expect the LV apex. And we can see that this is sort of mostly positioned actually in the proximal aorta. And again, this was, uh, actually in this case, it was we don't have subsequent repositioning. Um, but this is not I, this is not optimal positioning of the LVAD device. On occasion, uh, a variant of the impella may be used for right ventricular assist. So here is an example of that. <clears throat> Sorry, here's an example of that. We can see now in this case, the, the direction of flow is different from the LVAD function. Um, we have the impella coming in from the IVC, traversing the right atrium and ventricle into the right ventricular outflow tract. And here's the tip sort of in the region of the main or proximal left pulmonary artery. You can see the J tip is now in the outflow direction so in blood, inflowing blood is gonna come from the IVC and we pumped through here uh, into the pulmonary artery distally in that direction. So moving to some other temporary ventricular assist device uh, devices, we have this device known as the tandem heart, which comes in from the IVC it's actually trans, uh, goes across the atrial septal, so trans, trans atrial septal, uh, and then is positioned in the left atrium. And with this device, the outflow, this is the inflow part that we're seeing here, and the outflow is in the femoral artery distally. Um, for right ventricular assist, we have 
this example device, uh, this one happens to be called Protec Duo. You can see that it enters through the IJ um, with sort of two lumens here, goes into the right ventricle, into the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, so here is the outflow portion. The inflow is going to be somewhere in here where that second lumen is in the region of the right atrium. So again, these devices are going to change over time. And if you just think about the physiology, then you can understand where the devices are supposed to be, where the inflow should be, where the outflow should be. Now here is another device that is used in more severe cases where the uh, patient has uh, partially open sternotomy and we've got both right and left ventricular assist cannulae that are actually protruding through the skin. So here we have inflow in the atrium, outflow in right ventricle, inflow in left ventricle. And these radiopaque markers here are um, ties for rubber tourniquets that help to hold the cannula in place. But again, if you think about the physiology, this is of course, there's a machine outside the patient that's pumping here. But if you think about where the blood needs to come from and go to, you can understand the placement of all of these cannulae. Now, one final note to make um, is about doing angiography in these patients. And I'll particularly talk about uh, pulmonary angiography, although similar considerations would apply to aortic angiography. Now in patients with ventricular assist devices, particularly those that are set up in a VA ECMO uh, circuit, in other words, blood is being taken from the venous system, is being put through ECMO and or pump for pressure assist and being placed back into um, into the arterial circulation, this obviously changes the contrast dynamics um, because uh, contrast may be sucked out of the pool where it's being injected and then will go th through the machinery. And again, you have to keep these considerations in mind uh, when you try to do timing of your studies. So here we have a patient who was on peripheral VA ECMO. You can see here is an inflow cannula within the right atrium. The outflow is going to be in the uh, groin. And they requested a pulmonary angiogram in this patient. Now, simply injecting blood into an IV in this case, um, that contrast, injecting contrast rather into an IV in this case, that contrast is going to be sucked into the ECMO system and will be um, put out back into the femoral artery with retrograde flow, so it would not be really conducive to doing a PE study and would cause confusing imaging. And in fact, we can see in this case, let's change my windowing a little bit here, we can see that there is, so there's the inflow ECMO cannula with contrast in the uh, right atrium here. We've got contrast in the aorta coming up. This is the abdominal aorta, right? Descending aorta is brightly opacified with contrast. And then as we get up to the aortic arch, we suddenly see some mixing defects, mixing artifacts. <clears throat> and then we even get a blood fluid level here, blood contrast level where there's unopacified blood here. And as we go more proximally into the ascending aorta, we can see less and less contrast opacification, more and more unopacified blood, and the LV itself is totally unopacified by contrast. And again, this is because contrast is being sucked up by the ECMO circuit in from the IVC, is being put into the pump, and then is being replaced into the femoral artery in the groin with retrograde flow from the abdominal aorta into the thoracic aorta. So one consequence is this sort of pseudo dissection appearance of the ascending aorta. The other consequence, as you can see here, is that even though we've got good opacification 
in the atrium and great opacification of the descending aorta, we have zero contrast in the pulmonary artery. So the solution in these cases is to simply do a delayed scan. Now obviously the contrast opacification on that delayed scan is not as good as you would get in a traditional pulmonary angiogram in a normal patient. However, there's no other way of getting contrast into the pulmonary circulation. So you can see here we've done a delayed scan. That pseudo dissection appearance of the aorta, of course, is normalized, and we have uniform contrast throughout the pulmonary arterial circulation. Generally, we do these at approximately 60 to 90 seconds. Um, you can try several different delays. In this case, we actually also use dual energy, um, and so you can reconstruct the images with virtual monoenergetic imaging at lower KEV to help improve your apparent contrast. Um, so again, these studies are never going to be ideal, but you can at least rule out central pulmonary arterial feeling defects in these cases. So I hope that was a good quick overview of cardiac support devices, some of their positioning issues, and some of their imaging. And as I mentioned, as long as you think of the physiology of how these devices work, you can generally understand where they're supposed to be positioned and how to image them.